Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Fantasy Bros Football Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Harris. With me, of course, is Mike Tagliere. You can find us on Twitter at Dan Harris80 and at Mike Tagliere NFL Tags. How are you? Good, man. Just looking looking forward to getting past week 10, the week that was like legitimately a disaster in every sort of the way for fantasy football and people that like expect rational coaching and you know players to take advantage of certain matchups and and whatever it, it, it's in the past it's it's beyond us we're in week 11 now right yeah it was frustrating though i will we're technically not and i'm gonna need at least like three half ppr points from ryan all tonight oh, ryan, and nah. I, I, ryan nah i will blame <laughs> you i will blame you if it doesn't happen i'm just letting you know so be ready for that uh but look we're going to be talking about the waiver wire today of course week 11 We've got a great guest to do that. It is none other than the king, Scott Engel, FSWA Hall of Famer, writer and serious XM Fantasy host for Rotoballer. You can find more of his work at Sportsline, at Seahawks.com, and you can find him on Twitter at Scott E. The King. Scott, thanks for popping on today. How you doing? Hey, it's uh, great to be here with you guys. Uh, you know, Fantasy Pros, obviously, one of the top sites in the industry. And Dan, I know you're like, you know, the head chef there. And Mike, That's- I have... So much respect for your work. I don't know if you're aware that uh, I constantly link to your articles and talk about them on SiriusXM Fantasy about the studies that you do each year about the ages of wide receivers, running backs, etc. and when they decline because fantasy players get that wrong so much. They think age 30 is the old age for everybody, <laughs> and your articles pointed out the best, and I'm constantly linking to them and mentioning to it. When people say, Russell Wilson's old at 31, I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that, Scott. It means a lot. I, I try and I can get to those things because I, I think we get to the off season and it, it's difficult to come up with unique things, but it's like tackling something that fantasy owners believe, but doesn't always necessarily seem to be true. It's like tackling those narratives that people believe in. It's just uh, the research needs to back that stuff up. Well, this is fantastic. This is the first guest we've ever had that has respected Tags' work. So yeah. we're off to a very, a very, very good start on this podcast. I'm kidding, of course. Tags, I love you. You're the goat. And, you know, you make me want to be a better man. Um, let's get into it here. We're going to be talking about the waiver wire, as you guys know. But to do it right, you got to check out our waiver wire assistant. It's over at Fantasy Pros dot com slash my playbook you can identify the top players to add in your league you can view the percentage of experts who would add that player to your roster and you can get a detailed analysis of the impact on your team again that's fantasypros.com slash my playbook all right usual game plan here for our waiver wire show we're going to talk about the notable waiver wire pickups by position beginning with running back then wide receiver then quarterback then tight end we'll talk about our top five overall waiver wire pickups our top qb and dst streamers and then a game of drop or keep where we'll talk about some fringe fantasy relevant guys that we'll talk about whether or not we want to drop them or keep them but let's get to a couple of news items that broke uh before we started actually legitimately as i was just talking a tweet came from adam Schefter that said the dolphins have waived jordan howard that does not really move the needle fantasy purposes since he's Basically been a healthy and active for the majority of the season, but regardless, you should know that. Christian McCaffrey is unlikely to play Sunday against the Lions, so make sure that you haven't dropped Mike Davis yet. Chris Thompson is expected to go on injured reserve. Teddy Bridgewater has a sprained MCL, so it sounds like it's no long-term damage and that he is going to be play, going to be able to play sooner rather than later, but it's likely that he's going to be out this week. If he doesn't play this week against the Lions, Scott, what do you think the impact is on the passing game and the wide receivers for the Carolina Panthers makes it all uncertain you know and I don't you know maybe he'll play maybe we don't we have to wait and watch see the reports uh later this week but you know we've seen that Teddy Bridgewater has a tremendous connection with Robbie Anderson who is so underrated as a borderline fantasy wide receiver one this year you could argue but who's he gonna have the connection with you know it's uh you know is it going to be more is it going to be him uh, maybe to a lesser degree, Samuel, and then you have you have no Christian McCaffrey again this week. We don't know what this offense is going to look like. Yeah, tags. What do you think? I mean, how do you evaluate a situation where we really don't have much of a book here on on Walker and what he's going to look like? 
Yeah, Walker, he could take more chances than Bridgewater does. Uh, I was looking at NFL's next-gen stats earlier today, and I saw that uh, Teddy Bridgewater is basically not throwing the ball into tight coverage, and that's hurting DJ Moore, who's actually averaging the fewest yards of separation at target among these three wide receivers. So Walker might actually benefit someone like DJ Moore uh, if he's willing to throw the ball into tighter coverage than Bridgewater. And it kind of it's kind of the same thing that Bridgewater did last year uh, with the Saints, just learning how to take care of the football, not turning it over. So uh, Walker might be a little bit more prone to turnovers. He has a, a cannon. I mean, in terms of when I've seen him come into the game for Teddy Bridgewater, he looks like he's got a cannon. So uh, I'll be interested to see how this offense pans out. But anybody that tells you they know what's going to happen with this wide receiver core with Walker under center, they're, they're lying to you. We're all just taking educated guesses here. Yeah. Well, and the again, one good ca- thing is, and, uh, you know, they are playing Detroit. So to Mike's right. point, there is some upside, and we just don't know what the floors are going to be. Yeah, and again, as you mentioned, Scott, right at the start, we don't actually know technically that he's even been ruled out for this game. It's certainly that there is some optimism that he could play, but probably given where the Panthers are in the standings, it's a safe bet that they'll at least give Bridgewater a week to rest up. The other QB injury that we have to talk about, and it sounds like even though we don't know anything right now, but it could be a little long term, is Drew Brees. He is, I think, currently, unless I've missed it in the last hour or something, undergoing an MRI on his ribs. We don't know the result yet. Uh, He's likely going to miss some time, is the speculation, based on the fact that it's not just the ribs, but he's just been banged up lately. You've seen him limited in practice with a shoulder injury. So we'll get to Jameis Winston in particular as a potential option off the waiver wire. But let's assume for right now that Drew Brees is going to miss time. They've got Atlanta coming up. Let's talk about the other options other than at quarterback or the Saints. What do you think it would do to their fantasy stock if Jameis Winston has to start at least next week, Scott? I think things remain pretty much the same because Winston knew who his go-to guy was in Tampa Bay. It was Godwin, and obviously it's Michael Thomas uh, in New Orleans. Uh, you know, Alvin Kamara's role doesn't really change there. And, you know, none of the other pass catchers have really been reliable. So uh, I I don't think it changes the outlook too much. It's not like you're going to bench Michael Thomas or, you know, worry about Alvin Kamara. Yeah, I mean, realistically, Tags, it really is. Of course, you're starting Kamara and you're still starting Thomas. So I don't really know necessarily what the impact is. But what do you think here? Well, I, the impact is to fantasy streamers like uh, Jameis Winston against the Atlanta Falcons, because if you look at the Falcons matchup, it's a matchup you have to go to the air. Uh, if you, I think people would be shocked to hear this. And I've already started research for the primer this week. And the Falcons have allowed the fewest fantasy points on the ground to running backs this year. I, I, I'm, I'm not making this up like at all. They've allowed just 75.3 fantasy points on the ground to running backs this year, which is the lowest in the NFL. Running backs as a whole have averaged the six fewest fantasy points per game against the Falcons. So going and get through the air, it makes tons of sense. Teams only run the ball 36% of the time against them. Second lowest rate in the NFL. So Jameis Winston should be a streamer this week. The question is, how much do they involve Taysom Hill? Does he come off the field? Do they split some of those reps? I don't know. But really, Sean Payton, seriously, just trust Jameis Winston this week. Let him air it out. Let, let us relive to 2019 a little bit and reading between the lines tags it really sounds like what the big takeaway is from what you said is that you need to bench alvin kamara next no no (laughs) latavius murray you probably do but you should probably be benching latavius murray anyway so don't (laughs) even worry about it Uh, all right let's one thing about the falcons sorry to interrupt no 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 but uh one thing about the falcons ever since they fired dan quinn they've been playing better on defense and uh you know they've been more aggressive getting sacks and turnovers the falcons might be a sneaky streaming defense next week Ooh, ooh, all right i like the spicy take in the falcons <laughs> yeah. i mean this is kind of what they do i guess they, we they look kinda... for sacks and turnovers now yeah. not yeah. points allowed yeah yep and again the falcons last year i know that they didn't fire dan quinn of course but they did turn it around and look much better overall last year as well maybe they're just a second half team who knows but let's get into the waiver wire here let's start at running back uh scott who is your number one pickup at the running back position this week Owned in only 43% of CBSSports.com leagues, Cam Akers. I know Malcolm Brown scored two touchdowns uh, against the Seahawks on Sunday, but Cam Akers led this team in carries. They've been keeping the seat warm for him. You know, he had the rib cartilage issue earlier this year. Unusual preseason as a rookie, but we saw DeAndre Swift come along slowly. A lot of these rookies have come along slowly. You know, Daryl Henderson has been the best uh, fantasy player in this backfield. And then you have Malcolm Brown getting sprinkled in. But I don't think Sean McVay wants to go with a committee approach. He drafted 
Cam Akers, 52nd overall with their first pick in the NFL draft because he wanted a potential feature back, and that's what he identified Cam Akers as. Cam Akers is starting to slowly come along, and within the next two to three games, I believe that he's going to be the featured back for the Rams as they projected, and this is a forward-looking pickup. This is really interesting to me, Tags, because Akers is a fascinating case for me because, again, he did get the most carries and the most yards, I believe, of the running backs yesterday. Mm -hmm. But again, you had Malcolm Brown scoring touchdowns. You had Daryl Henderson scoring touchdowns. So, Tags, what do you think about Akers as a pickup? Is he your top guy for this week? No, I think it requires an injury for me to trust Akers at all in a starting lineup. You know, he did have a tough matchup against Seattle's actually a pretty decent run defense, despite the fact that they allowed three rushing touchdowns uh, to them last week. But up on the schedule, I mean, we have Tampa Bay this week. You are not putting Cam Akers in your lineup against Tampa Bay. You don't really want to put any running back in your lineup against Tampa Bay unless they're catching a whole lot of passes. And we didn't see Akers involved in the passing game at all. That's Malcolm Brown's job. The week after that, it's against the 49ers, who have been a funnel defense. You can't run the ball against them. We saw Alvin Kamara just total 15 yards in the ground around uh, this week and you know it's, it's just not a matchup you want to target so those two matches so you're, you're picking him up basically as a bench stash because you need an injury for him to get on the field and then looking forward even going to his fantasy ske- like playoff schedule the Patriots the Jets I, I know the Jets have allowed some fantasy points but they're a better run defense than they are pass defense and then Seattle again in week 16 so I'm not really – it's it's one of those backfields where I don't think that we can have any clear start, including Daryl Henderson, without an injury to one of these guys uh, because – Again, Malcolm Brown's siphoning those pass routes. He's running more than double the pass routes of Daryl Henderson. Akers isn't involved in the passing game, so it's like touchdown or bust. So if they're sharing carries three ways, it's just I I cannot trust him. Again, this is a forward-looking pickup. (laughs) Uh, With all respect, Mike, this is a forward-looking pickup. I believe that this is not going to be a committee in about two to three weeks' time. And if I'm getting volume from the guy, Mm -hmm. I can't always worry about the matchup. Yeah. So you think, just to be clear, Scott, this is because uh, I want to make this point clear. You think regardless of an injury, you don't need the injury to Brown. You don't need the injury to Henderson. You think just by Akers' talent, just by the way they came out and obviously gave Akers a lot more work than they had before. And the fact that he led the team in carries and yards, that he is going to be able to break away from the pack in the, you know within a couple of weeks, at least. Maybe not this coming week, but within a couple of weeks, regardless of an injury, right? Yeah, I believe this is the signal that this is what they wanted all along. I don't think McVeigh ideally wants a committee. Malcolm Brown's done a nice job, but he's a he's a journeyman quote type, even though he's not a journeyman because he's been on the same team. Daryl Henderson, uh, you know, he's he's done it he's done a nice job here and there, but I really believe they want Akers to lead this backfield and head into the NFL playoffs with a clear plan and a clear running back. It's taken a lot of these rookies a longer time to develop because of an abbreviated preseason. You got the injury for him. I believe it's gonna be his backfield very soon. All right, so let me ask you something, Scott. Let's say you're not you're not in desperate need of a running back. Everybody needs a running back in fantasy, like every single right. fantasy mm-hmm. manager does. But you're not one of these, you know, individuals who, like I am joking about it, but legitimately I am starting Ryan Nall in a couple <laughs> of leagues this week because right. I'm just I, I'm just like you're not in that situation. But you need to add a running back. What percent of your fab do you think you'd be willing to spend on him? I'd be willing to spend forty percent of my fab on him because again, as you illustrate, Dan. Yep. There's not a lot out there on running back, and we can always use a running back. And I think there's upside for this kid going forward. I I think we certainly haven't seen the best of him. Man, I love the aggressiveness, Scott. Mm-hmm. And again, Fab right now is very interesting, in my opinion. You're in week 11, so what do you think? 50%, 40% of your league is probably checked out. What you really need to be doing, essentially, when you're making your bids, is checking on who else is in the same situation, who else is still in playoff contention, who else needs that pickup, and base your bids off of that. All right, Tags, not Cam Akers for you. Who's your number one this week? My number it's it's kind of a tie atop for me. It's uh, Salvan Ahmed and uh, Naheem Hines. I, I really don't know which one I want to go with because uh, Ahmed is a a guy that you can plug into your lineup for one week and you know you're going to get 15 touches out of him because Gaskin's out at least one more week. Matt Breida might come back, but Matt Breida, even going back to his 49ers days, I think teams have figured out you do not want to rely on Matt Breida for more than you know a handful of touches per week. He, he's also coming off a multi-week hamstring injury. Don't want to trust him. It is a tougher matchup against Denver, so it's not exciting, but again, a running back that's going to get 15 touches that has some value, but if you're thinking a little bit more like, hey, Tags, I don't really care about just one week. I want to find someone that's 
going to offer me value here and there, and I'm willing to accept some risk to do it. Naheem Hines looks like the best running back in Indianapolis, and that's the thing. I even, I even mentioned this. I was watching the Thursday night game, and I said, let's be honest. We just know that Naheem Hines is going to get like four touches the next week, and everybody loved it, yeah. right? And people are like, well, no, he looks like the best running back. I'm like, he looked like the best running back back in week one, did he not? <laughs> the following week, he had one touch. I yes. I mean, these these backfields, like the Rams that we just talked about, uh, like them, like there, there's so many backfields out there that you just can't trust on a weekly basis. This feels like it's it's Kyle Shanahan running this Colts team, and you just can't trust any of them on a weekly basis. The, the, the unfortunate part of all of this is that they're playing the Packers this week. It's a matchup that you could not I mean outside of the Lions I don't know if you could ask for a better matchup for a running back so you know Naheem Hines I almost put him at number one but I I almost felt dirty doing it so I didn't yeah their schedule going forward is we talked about it forever coming in I mean after Green Bay they have Tennessee Houston Las Vegas Houston again I, if I we were thinking Jonathan Taylor and I will offer an apology to all of our listeners <laughs> I believe this is like our eighth waiver wire podcast in a row that we have talked about and in Indianapolis field. Colts running back. Yeah. So I apologize for that. So Scott, why don't you, before I get back to tags on something, what, what are your thoughts on Ahmed and Naeem Hines? Well, again, you know, this is why I went with acres because things are so uncertain everywhere else. I mean, Ahmed would be my number one. If I knew he wasn't a one week play, you know, yeah. he's, he's my number two, but he showed some real spark. You know, he was able to push the pile. He was able to make people miss tackles yesterday and until Gaskin comes back I think he's the guy I've always liked Breida he runs with a lot of spunk and tenacity but the guy can never stay healthy for more than two series so right. uh the, with him and then with Hines it, you know I think I think uh Micah illustrated it perfectly in number week two he was like the top pickup in fantasy football but he's a satellite back and, you know, who they occasionally use near the goal line. We, we don't know who it's going to be this week. We don't know if Phillip Rivers is going to lead the team in rushing this week. Right. That's the issue for me with Hines. And again, Tags, you mentioned it. One catch, four yards in week two after he had that monstrous game. And Tags, you remember we talked about Hines after that. You were completely buying in. At that point, you were. You yeah, were I admitted. I was. I, I came out. I even admitted. So Andy Holloway, me and him, the fantasy footballers, before the season, I put out something saying, I'll let someone else draft Naheem Hines. I don't understand why people want to do it. And then I even, I made a public apology to Andy Holloway. <laughs> Andy, I just, I demand an apology back. Um, so I, I, I basically gave him a, a public apology saying I was wrong. And then week two happens and I'm like, oh no. And then I was like, no, no, don't cut him. Don't cut him. Maybe it was just a, a thing. Maybe he was dealing with an ailment or something that we didn't know about. And as these weeks have gone on, this was just the, what, the second time all season long where he's gotten double digit touches. So it's like, oh, it's so frustrating because again, he looks better than Jonathan Taylor. Jordan Wilkins is not involved in the passing game against Green Bay. It, I mean, I, I have no idea. I'm going to be honest with you, Dan. I have zero clue how I'm going to rank this Colts backfield in week 11. I love it. That's how I, you, I want you to feel because that's how I feel as well. I, I think the bottom line is I'm not going to want to start any of them. Let me ask a little bit more of a long term. Then I will offer my opinion, what I think about running back this week. Let me take a little bit of a longer term view on Ahmed. We know that Ahmed's got the start this weekend, right? That That's what we know because we know Gaskin is out. They're playing Denver. Then they have the Jets. Then they have the Bengals. Then they have the Chiefs. We are just assuming right now, because the report was that Gaskin is going to be out three games, which is why it was on IR, that he's coming back. Let's at least point out that we don't actually know that. We don't necessarily know that he's going to come back in week 12 coming in. But number two, the bigger question that I want to ask you, Scott, do you think there's any chance, given how good Ahmed has looked, and I, I know that Gaskin looked great, can Ahmed carve out some sort of role in probably essentially destroy both backs values but could he carve out a larger role even with Gaskin back do you think or do you think once Gaskin gets back it's his show and that's it I think Gaskin is the guy you know Ahmed was on the practice squad he he was signed you know in August after he got cut by another team it it, it was a nice uh sort of uh you know performance but you know the the Patriot the, the Dolphins were very covert with who they were going to start and we didn't know until pregame warm-ups when he was running with the first-team offense. I don't think the defense knew either. You know, and maybe with uh, with a week to prepare for him, you know, he might not have such a good game against Denver, although Denver isn't a terrible matchup. I just feel like like Gaskin is, is their guy, and he's really earned that number one running back role. But now they've cut Howard because they know they can lean on Ahmed for depth if something Howard happens to Gaskin, you know, again in the future. 
Yeah, and Tags, we talked about it very briefly last night. You're in agreement with that, right? You think when when Gaskin gets back, it's his role and that's it. I do. Uh, Ahmed can he can obviously carve out a little bit of a role. Maybe he takes on that Matt Breida role and they kind of move on from Breida too. Because I I mean Jordan Howard, you mentioned they cut him at the top of the show, and uh, he was would they give him a two year ten million dollar deal? So uh, they're quick to move on in that team, and I, I I can appreciate what Brian Flores is doing there in Miami. He's kind of just saying, you know what, you perform, you're going to play. Uh, but Gaskin, I think he'll walk back into – he may not be the complete workload that he was getting before, but even if it's you know, 80%, 90% of that, he's still getting plenty of touches. All right. So for me, Ahmed is my top choice. And the reason why is I'm going to buy everything you guys are saying, that there is no role for him after this week. I don't necessarily care for him to be my top <laughs> running back pickup for this week. And, and the reason is – as I said, Ryan Nall, that's who I'm starting this week. If you're telling me I can have a guaranteed starter for a team that, by the way, their offense looks pretty good. I mean, it is a, they're able to move the ball. I get that the matchup isn't great for Ahmed this weekend. But if you're giving me the unquestioned starter, and I'm not worried about I, Matt Breed is not coming back in next week and seeing 10 touches. Like, that's just not the way it's going to work for him. And if he does, if that's the plan... Unfortunately, he'll probably leave after three because that's just <laughs> unfortunately what happens with Matt Breida. I will take the guaranteed starter tags. I've said this so many times on the show. Running backs, I play week to week. So if you give me somebody who's a guaranteed starter for one week, I will take that for now. And that is why, Tags, I said Duke Johnson last week was my top guy, even though it was very close, because I did think he has the greatest chance of being the guy who I'm like, oh, I'm definitely putting you in as a starter. Now, that didn't work mm -hmm. out that well. But, of course, you know, now you if you did have Duke Johnson, you have him for a little bit of time. So I will have Ahmed as my top guy, but not, I mean, 15 percent max for me and that's really if you need a running back because i do think his ceiling is limited for Hines, no no <laughs> i mean i i will pick him up almost certainly because i you have to you can't ignore a guy like that but goodness gracious i just i i don't want it i don't want the indianapolis backfield whatsoever so i am staying away from that so that is my uh you know short story on the running backs let me ask something we've now talked about cam Akers, we've talked about naheem Hines, we've talked about savan Ahmed. Scott, is there any other running back who is widely available on the waiver wire who you're even thinking about picking up this week? Well, Caleb Balaj is still available in 40% of leagues. Yep. Uh, I, I think and it, it, it stands to reason, it makes sense, that a lot of people didn't believe, including me, that he could build on one week yep. uh, of a good outing you know, last week. Uh, he was on his third team of the year. Heck, the guy got cut by the Jets. I didn't <laughs> expect anything. But then he went out and had another good game last last week. He's had over 30 points his last two weeks. We're not 100% sure when Austin Eckler comes back. We know Justin Jackson's on IR and Josh Kelly's been disappointing. Even if Eckler somehow comes back this week, they're not going to make Eckler like a full-time featured guy. They want him ideally to share with somebody else who's physical. And that can be Balazs. He can even when Eckler comes back, he could have a role. So you know he's somebody that I'm looking at. And to a lesser degree, if you have some roster room, you know Alex Collins came in yesterday, looked good on a 13-yard touchdown run uh, for the team that originally drafted him. Carson can't stay healthy. Kai can't stay healthy. Uh, DJ Dallas is showing that outside of the goal line, he's really not ready to be a consistent runner. So. Uh, if you have Car if you have uh, if you have Chris Carson who may return for Thursday's game, maybe maybe not, but it's on the, he's on the right side of questionable, I believe, early in the week. You know, Alex Collins could be that insurance play because they just can't trust Carlos Hyde to stay healthy. All right, so I want to get to you tags about this, but I do want to say a couple of things the way I, I, I'm thinking about it. Number one, I think that Balazs would, uh, you know, and you, you mentioned it's got about 40% of leagues he's available. So usually above the threshold that we're, we start talking about, but I agree if he were available, he would be actually my top pickup, I think, at running back for the week because there is no way Austin Eckler is coming back this week. I know everybody got super excited when they saw that video of him running and him saying, you know, whatever the exact verbiage he used. He's not about to come back. He's got at least a week, probably at least two before he's back. So I think Kalen Balaj is a guy who you can reliably start for the next couple of weeks. And I agree that he could carve out a bigger role going forward. And kudos to Adam Gase, greatest coach ever, trying to trade for him <laughs> initially before, unfortunately, that fell did through. You just, I'm sorry. Did you just use reliably and Balaj in the same <laughs> That's why it I is. I can't believe that. It, you know, who? this is unbelievable. We talked about 2020. It's like it's an unbelievable fantasy 
where we're talking about must start and Caleb Bellage. And if I would have said to you in the summer, you have Justin Herbert and James Robinson as your top quarterback and running back, you'll be good. Who would have believed that? <laughs> there is no more no more great example of what 2020 is yep. and the fact that Caleb Bellage is probably going to be a league winner in fantasy league. Tags, <laughs> I want to ask if he's your number one pickup, but I, I do want to mention Collins, if for no other reason. And again, you mentioned it, Scott. It is the Thursday night game. And all I will say is this. Pete Carroll, probably the most optimistic coach that when you have coach speak of people going to be ready he he sounds very questionable right now I, I realize that it's trending up and there was a report last week or coming into this week that it was going to be good for Carson and his his outlook looked good but I don't know reading the tea leaves I, I'm not I don't feel that great about it so if we don't know about it right now with the Thursday night game mm-hmm. I think Collins is definitely somebody that fantasy managers should be looking at okay Tex fine you've been quiet for like three minutes I apologize <laughs> go to you what do you think of Balaj and Collins uh, Balaj, if he was in this list, I actually might put him at the top because, yep. uh, again, I don't expect Austin Eckler to be back this week. Joshua Kelly has shown just how bad he is. Uh, Kelly, in terms of next-gen stats, he's averaging .66 fewer yards per carry than he's been expected to based on the number of men that he's seen in the box, based on the yards before contact. Um I, I talked about it. I think there's one game all year long where he's averaged over three yards per carry. And, you know, this is a, a team that has churned out running backs. You know, you think about it. Melvin Gordon was successful. Austin Eckler's been successful. Justin Jackson in limited opportunity has been successful, but hurt a lot of the time. Uh, and now we have Kalen Balaj being successful. And just Josh, uh, just Joshua Kelly has just not been very good. So Kalen Balaj is going to be the starting running back uh, until further notice, until Austin Eckler comes back to this lineup. It's a team that's scoring a ton of points under Justin Herbert. So I might put him up at number one over Ahmed, to be honest with you. And then as for Collins, if we hear that Chris Carson's not going to play on Thursday before waivers go, I... I mean, Collins would be the play. Uh, I think I would play him over all these other guys uh, on a one-week sample. But again, you're, you, it's a rent-a-player. Understand what you're grabbing. Uh, because against the Cardinals, I looked at this team, uh, this matchup already, and uh, the Seahawks implied team total for this game is 31 points. Uh, the Cardinals have not allowed more than 84 yards on the ground to any running back. That does yep. limit some appeal, but... Understand this, Alex Collins actually ran more pass routes than DJ Dallas last week, so he has a role in that game too. So, again, in a game where they're projected to score four-plus touchdowns, Alex Collins has plenty of value. So uh, he would probably be my number one if you needed a one-week run of player. Yeah, he led the backfield with 32 snaps. Tags real quick. So let's say both Balaj and Collins are out there. How much fab are you spending on them? Oh, if you need a win, like dramatically, I, I think you have to spend, you know, 20% of your fab to get those guys to get a win if that's what it's going to take. But because um, I mean, Heinz and Ahmed, those are guys that I feel like 10% bids. Like, I don't feel like this is a very strong waiver wire week. I, I felt like that throughout the entire year. So it's just a par for the course, I guess. But uh, yeah. but yeah, if you need a one week rent a player and we hear again, we have to hear that Carson is out. Um, then Collins would be my top pickup. I, I will say this. I don't think you need to wait to hear that someone is out. And I'll give the Gio Bernard example where, I, you know, I, yeah. I spent a large percent. I don't know what I spent. Probably in a league where I was desperate for running backs, I probably spent 25% on Gio, even though everything sounded okay on Mixon. You know, it was just very questionable. They saw him dancing on the sidelines or whatever, thought he'd be okay after he left that game. Gio now has been a starter for three games and they had their bye. You never know. Get, you know, get what you can to win a week. And even if there's uncertainty, I think adding Collins is probably a good idea. All right, anybody we haven't talked about it running back right now, Scott, or are you willing to go to wide receiver at this point? No, it's pretty much desolate. And the last thing I'll say about Collins is, you know, Mike makes some great points. They score a lot of points. He can finish off drives. And, Mm -hmm. you know, in the passing game, uh, Travis Holmer has has an injury, which may keep him out on a short week too. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's get to wide receiver. Scott, who is your top waiver wire pickup at the position? I'm going to go with Michael Pittman Jr. Coming off of his best game in his career so far. We saw before the groin injury, he had a really nice game before that week. Uh, He's come on in the last two games. Now, like you guys were talking about with the Colts running backs, they rotate running backs, they rotate why they rotate tight ends they rotate wide receivers i'm shit pretty sure they much rotate trainers uh, <laughs> but i haven't looked into that fully but i really believe that philip rivers does need a true number one wide receiver i like this kid he's got size leaping ability yard after yardage after the catch ability and he is widely available he's only owned in 10 percent of cbssports.com leagues and we've seen over the last two years these rookie and second year wide receivers can make a quick impact i am in 
Complete agreement with this one. How about you, Tags? Is Pittman Jr. your top waiver wire pick about wide receiver? He's in the top tier. There's three of them that I would go back and forth on, and I could make an argument for any of them. Obviously, Pittman is the guy that's most recent, uh, seeing eight targets in that game against the Titans. Now, the Titans matchup is just fantastic. You, yeah. you really can't add. I think wide receivers are catching 70% of their targets against them. Uh, so it was a really, really, really good matchup. And then now going against the Packers, do they get J.R. Alexander back? Um, low play counts. I just worry about the offense in general because they do have so many pass catchers now. T.Y. Hilton's healthy. Naheem Hines is playing more. Um, Zach Paschal is locked down that slot role. We're going to get Paris Campbell back at some point. The tight ends rotate. So it's just, I don't know if there's going to be a whole lot of consistency, but I could definitely see it with Pittman. He is the total package, and he was someone that reminded me a little bit of like a Vincent Jackson for Phillip Rivers. Unfortunately, Rivers doesn't have the same deep ball that he used to. Um, but the other guys in that conversation are Jalen Rager, who is dealing with very, very bad quarterback play, but he's yes. getting opportunities. And if Wentz does ever turn it around, obviously Rager's got some ma a massive ceiling. Um, and then Sammy Watkins. Sammy Watkins, okay. in the games that he's played, I mean, the, the full games he's played, he has seen seven, eight, and nine targets. I mean, playing with Patrick Mahomes in an offense that can't seem to get the ball moving on the ground, they're throwing the ball more than they ever have. So uh, Sammy Watkins is the number two wide receiver for Patrick Mahomes. I, I definitely be believe that this is the top three that I'm considering on waiver wires. I don't think you need to, like, break your bank or your budget or anything to acquire any of them, but I think that they're all in that same tier. All right, Scott, how do you feel about Rager and Sammy Watkins? With Rager, I can see the upside, but you know, like Mike pointed out, it's it's been so uh, you know bad the way that uh, that Wentz has played at times that he kind of caps the upside of of him and other players. Look at Fulgham not doing nothing this week. Dallas mm -hmm. Goddard hasn't uh, you know reached his ceiling as far as as far as uh, Sammy Watkins goes. Uh, you know, I've sworn that guy off for like the last two plus years. <laughs> He's been overrated for about a good four or five years now. Uh, doesn't take enough advantage of the opportunities. He has one game over 65 yards this year. He is the most underachieving guy that I have ever seen since he left Buffalo and had that one good year. He was nothing in the Rams offense. He disappeared between weeks 2 and 16 last year. He only shows up in the postseason. And a powerful offense like this, to have receiving yardage lines of like 11, 62, 43, and 24, I don't want any Sammy Watkins on my squad. I'm sorry. So but if tags, he does well the rest of the way, I will say tag set it. <laughs> <laughs> tags, you're not concerned then about Demarcus Robinson or Michael Hardman factoring in more than they were at the beginning of the season, given that Watkins has been out for several weeks and they've kind of gotten more involved in the offense as time has gone by. No, Robinson's just a depth guy for them. He only plays when Sammy – he basically plays a full-time role when Sammy Watkins is out of the lineup. And Watkins is a little bit more versatile than him, uh, whereas Robinson is strictly a perimeter receiver. Watkins has moved into the slot. He kind of rotates. And that's why they like him and Tyreek Hill. Uh, on the field quite a bit because they can mix, mix and match those guys and get the matchup they want. And it's also the reason that Miko Hardman hasn't seen the field very much when Sammy Watkins is out there. Hardman is an electric player. Like, he deserves more opportunities, but for whatever reason, Andy Reid's a smart dude. And I'm not going to second guess him, but he basically limits the snaps, the amount of routes that Miko Hardman's out there. He's kept him on special teams, so maybe he's just, maybe it's like a, a Devin Hester thing. I don't want to, I don't want to bring up make a sore subject or anything but uh maybe a Devin Hester thing where Andy Reid says I don't want to ruin a good thing we have a good kick returner punt returner if we, we turn full-time to offense it might just it might take away with a special thing that we have when we bring him on the field so I don't know uh but again Andy Reid is a smarter guy than me when it comes to running an offense so um knowing that Sammy Watkins does get plenty of opportunities I understand he has disappointed for most of the time but opportunities from Patrick Mahomes I'll probably take those over opportunities from you know 40 year old Philip Rivers <laughs> so that's the only reason that I would say Watkins is in the same conversation with Pittman I think it's fair to say that if the one of the three of us or all three of us were running out there when they add Tyree Kill and Travis Kelsey and CEH, that probably one of us could return wide receiver two or three value for fantasy, even if it was just us. So my guess is you want someone else in that offense, some other wide receiver. And Watkins did look like he was going to be the guy before the injury. So I do think he's worth a pickup, but he is below Pittman for me and below Rager. Anybody else, Scott, that you're thinking about picking up this week at wide receiver that you think could be useful? Rashard Higgins is owned in just 35% of CBSSports.com leagues. And I think that, that uh, you know, that roster, uh, the amount of, of, of where he's rostered uh, will go down this week as people cut him. But the last two games the Browns have played, 
uh, since Odell Beckham Jr. went out, have been in terrible weather conditions. We haven't seen what Higgins can do. He had a big game right before that playing in relief. He says, he he told the beat reporters about his chemistry with uh, with Baker Mayfield. He said, people just haven't seen yet. You know, we're like wine in a glass together. We're smooth. And I, I believe that, that Rashard Higgins is really going to bust out in the next game or two. Yeah, I, Higgins was somebody who we talked about a while. Now, Tags, you weren't that big on him before when we first talked about him after Odell Beckham Jr.'s injury. Mm-hmm. So I imagine you're probably still not all that big on him now, right? Yeah, I would have been like a little higher on him had uh, Nick Chubb remained out of the lineup for a while because I think it would have presented more opportunities. But this team with Nick Chubb in the lineup, they want to run the ball, you know, 55% of the time, which is going to basically mean we're looking at a lesser version of the Vikings offense where that's a team that's averaged like 26 pass attempts per game. That's what the Browns want to do. They want to hide it. They want. They don't want to get involved in shootouts they just want to run the ball consistently and therefore even if you're even if they throw the ball let's say 28 times per game even if you get a massive 25 percent target share that amounts to seven targets it's not like it's a must start for every single player when they get seven targets so uh higgins is more of like a he's a guy when bye weeks are around i'm willing to probably throw him in, in a good matchup but you look at the matchup with philadelphia this week and that's not a good matchup so um i'm okay leaving him out there All right, anybody else then tags at wide receiver who you're thinking even about picking up this week? Uh, I mean, Keelan Cole, the matchup against Pittsburgh isn't as bad as people think it is. It's the best matchup you can get is in the slot against them. Um, You know, Tim Patrick against Miami, not a great matchup. Thank you at least for mentioning him, though, Tags. You know there's I know, I know. An obligatory. Actually, let me go to Scott on this because we basically argue about Tim Patrick. And I've been labeled the unfortunate Tim Patrick (laughs) fan, even though I'm not. It's not like I go crazy over the guy. But he is fairly reliable. I mean, even yesterday, six targets, four catches, 61 yards. And he left at just 42 snaps because he got ejected after getting into the fight. At least six targets in four of his last five games. Tags, you mentioned the schedule. It's not great. Miami and the Saints. But still, I mean, he's kind of somebody who in deeper leagues you can throw out there fairly reliably. And Tags wants nothing to do with him. This is the first time he's mentioned him. So, Scott, (laughs) any interest at all in Tim Patrick? Uh, I like him better than a little bit more than Sammy Watkins, but I guess oh. we're going to disagree when we go Watkins. <laughs> Patrick here, Cole Watkins plays in a better offense. But, you know, I have been a fan of Patrick. I always felt that he was a guy who you never saw it reflected in the numbers. When they ever give him a chance to see the field, they felt like they could trust him on key downs. And I don't think there's a whole lot of upside. Like with Higgins and like with Patrick, we're talking about Wide receiver four types, okay, yeah. here. But I believe they look for him in the end zone. They look for him on key passing downs. I believe he's he's an okay guy. I used him in one league yesterday. He got 10 points. I don't believe there's a high ceiling, but I believe there's always a decent floor with a guy like Tim Patrick. And my one other guy was Jakeem Grant because it seemed uh, he's only owned in 2% of leagues, and uh, it seems like Tua Tonga Viola likes to go to him. This is another guy like Patrick where I always felt like he was in the shadows and if they give him a little bit more of an opportunity that, you know, that he could show a little something. Tags, did you hear that? Tim Patrick, an okay guy. I will take that. I will take that all day long <laughs> to the back. It is worth noting that legitimately right across my, again, I have uh, Twitter notifications set for the majority of beat writers out there. And I, it is just pop up right now since we were talking about Patrick that Drew Locke is considered day-to-day. You, if you watched that game yesterday, you saw that he was pretty banged up, whether it was a shoulder, I'm not sure what it was, that he's day-to-day and he could sit this week against Miami, which would make Brett Rippon. I don't really know if that's a downgrade necessarily at this <laughs> point, but it is worth noting when we talk about Patrick. All one right. Thing, one thing about yeah. Denver before we move forward, sure. though, and, you know, we saw the backup quarterback play pretty good, uh, you know, at one point earlier this year. Yep. The one thing that worries me about Patrick and the one other guy we didn't mention is K.J. Hamler is available mm-hmm. in only 5% of leagues, and he's starting to come on. He had 90 yards from scrimmage, and he caught six of his 10 targets yesterday, and we haven't seen his downfield gears yet. So that concerns me with Patrick, that Hamler might start to rise and Patrick might start to fall. Yeah, I think you said Hamler was available in 5% of leagues. I think you meant rostered in 5% of leagues, right? I, that's, rostered that's, in 5% yes, of leagues. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah, no, I agree. Hamler is, look, all three of these guys, you know, Judy, of course, at the top, but all three of them, they are getting value mainly because Denver is constantly behind and they're forced to throw all the time. So in a pinch, you could go with any of them. All right, Tags, anybody else at wide receiver? You want to move to quarterback? Yeah, we can go to quarterback. All right, let's go to quarterback. <laughs> all right, Scott, top uh, waiver wire quarterback this week. Who do you have? The only one I have is Jameis Winston, who's rostered in 7% of CBS Sports 
Dotcom leagues, you know, going against Atlanta. Like I said, Atlanta's defense has been playing better. There is the concern of Taysom and Hill, but, you know, he always took snaps from Drew Brees, too. So it's possible that you could use Jameis Winston as a receiver. Uh, I mean, as a quarterback this week, especially in a two quarterback league, but in a one quarterback league, you got to consider for the matchup. You know, he's going to air it out, you know, and try to eat a W again this week. And, uh, you know, this could be a high scoring game. I'm expecting a high Vegas total, and he knows how to get involved in a, in a shootout. We could see Taysom Hill rush for a touchdown, but we could see Jameis Winston pass for at least two and 325 yards. Yeah, I I will say that I can't imagine that they would have signed Jameis Winston if they were willing to just turn over to Taysom Hill if Drew Brees got injured. Like, that just doesn't make all that much sense to me. So what about you, Tex? Winston is, of course, my clear cut favorite to pick up this week at quarterback how about you yeah for sure uh and i'm with you and and by the way when breeze got hurt they could have went with Taysom hill in that game last week so right. uh yeah it's jason Jameis winston so he would definitely be the one and if for whatever reason you can't get him and you need a backup quarterback i mean dirk uh <laughs> dirk uh kirk cousins <laughs> Uh, Kirk Cousins, I don't know how he's going to play tonight against yeah. the Bears. Probably going to look pretty terrible. But uh, he plays against Dallas in Week 11. They've yep. allowed uh, seven to nine quarterbacks to throw at least two touchdowns. So he's someone that you can look at. Andy Dalton at Minnesota. It's at least that game's played in a dome. Um, Dalton, he I know he looked like crap in the one game, but guys like cut him some slack. It could have been just a bad game against Washington. So it, by the way, Washington's been a pretty good defense. So um, Andy Dalton could be a, a decent backup option. Yeah, I mean, I think it's clearly Winston, and but I agree, Cousins. If you're if you're desperate for a streamer and you can't get Winston, Cousins probably makes a pretty good start. I will say again, news just comes as we're doing this podcast. That's all that happens is that Sam Darnold is out this week, so of course you want to go get Joe Flacco against Oof. the Chargers. Go ahead, be my guest. Um, all right, let's get to tight end right now. Uh, Scott, who's your top waiver wire tight end pickup? Uh, Jordan Reed is only rostered in thirty one percent of CBS leagues, and six catches for sixty two yards and. You know, when I was doing my fantasy pros rankings for week for week ten, no Kelsey, no Kittle. It's like I have yeah. Darren Waller and TJ Hawkinson as my one two. How how bad is this position? Look, yeah. we know that that Jordan Reed always has an unfortunate history of injuries, but as long as he can be in there and that tight end position is a big part of that playbook in San Francisco, you know, you gotta roll him out as a tight end one. Yeah, no, I think going forward, his long-term outlook is definitely good. He's on a bye this week, of course, which sort of dampens his his immediate outlook. But how about you, Tags? Are you picking up Reed, or is there another guy who you're looking at for more immediate help? No, I have Logan Thomas uh, as the guy this week. Uh, he's the one I would picked up just because uh, a tight end, I'm not going to grab someone like Jordan Reed and keep him on the bench. I, I If he were playing this week, I'd probably say he was the number one tight end uh, just because of the lack of options they have. But once he comes back from his bye, Debo Samuel will be back. Marie Mostert will be back. Probably Tevin Coleman will be back. Uh, so it's it's going to be a little bit more crowded there. Um, Logan Thomas against the Bengals this week, it's it's just a, a smash spot for tight ends. I mean, they've allowed so many different tight ends to go up and put up post big numbers. And when you look at Alex Smith in terms of what he's done to this point, he's targeted running backs and tight ends on the majority of his throws his average depth of target is just like 4.6 yards down the field uh so he's playing with a little happy feet he's playing a little scared uh understandably so uh so logan thomas should continue to rack up the targets against cincinnati a team that again they've struggled against tight ends so he'd be my number one yeah, and he's got six targets in back-to-back games. Out of curiosity, you, you talked about the landscape. Both Reed and Thomas, you know, were, were some of the, the better tight ends this week. So what do you think right now about Thomas, uh, Scott? Do you think he's worth a pickup if you're struggling at the position? Yeah, uh, owned in 40% of CBS leagues. And, uh, you know, he's got double-figure fantasy points in three of his last two games. Two 60-yard outings. You know, that should be exciting when we're talking about tight ends. Right. No, absolutely. It really is. Uh, meanwhile, <laughs> You know, again, we talk about news. That's breaking right as we're doing this. Uh, Schefter just tweeted out that Drew Brees has multiple rib fractures on both sides of his chest and a collapsed lung on the right side. So I think it's fair to say that he's going to miss significant time. There wasn't a timeline with that. So Jameis Winston takes on added importance if you are struggling at the quarterback position. Well, let's just very briefly talk about that. Assume for the sake of, of this conversation that Drew Brees is out for five weeks. He's out for the remainder of the fantasy season. Where do you think Winston would rank, just generally speaking, rest of season in your quarterback rankings, Scott? Of course, we have to be careful, as you guys would probably say, too, because we he's still not in the Tampa Bay offense. He's obviously in a new offense, but he's got a great offensive mind in Sean Payton. He's got some good wide receivers. 
I'm looking at him initially as potentially a back-end fantasy quarterback one because of volume. And we all know what we get from Jameis Winston. But, you know, when they brought for Jameis Winston in, they brought him in because they wanted to learn. They wanted to tutor him on the things he was doing wrong. So at worst, he's going to have volume and make turnovers. He's also going to throw to the backfield out of Kamara, which will help his numbers. And when you have turnovers, you know, the defense get the offense gets right back on the field. Now, the flip side is he could be more decisive. He could make better decisions. So for me, fantasy-wise, there's either volume or there's better decision-making. So I'm looking at him as potential back-end fantasy quarterback one, high-end fantasy quarterback two, right on that cusp. Yeah, that, that strikes me as exactly what I would do with him, Tags. Atlanta, Denver, Atlanta, yep. Philadelphia, KC, Minnesota. What do you think here going forward? That's what I was looking at, the schedule, because basically like he's, he's in that streaming conversation, and it's like, can you grab him and stream him for multiple weeks? Absolutely, with that yeah. schedule. Uh, and it's something that I was looking at with Drew Brees, and I was contemplating putting him as a buy this week if your trade deadline was still open, uh, just because that schedule they have coming up, as you mentioned, twice against Atlanta. Denver has been a funnel defense for the most part. Uh, Philadelphia is a tough one. Kansas City, not great, but Minnesota. Minnesota in week 16. So, but either way, the next three weeks, you'd be able to stream Jameis Winston. So yeah, I, I do think he's worth pick up. Yeah. All right. So let's get just to our top five overall, because we've been talking by position. Scott, why don't you break down your top five overall pickups this week? Number one is Cam Akers. Uh, I'm sure you guys won't fully agree, but again, <laughs> I'm trying to be forward looking here, especially sure. at running back. Uh, number two is is uh, is Kalen Balage, you know, still available in 40% of leagues. Number three, Michael Pittman Jr. You know, these young receivers have upside. Number four, Rashad Higgins. And number five, Logan Thomas, because you, you just, you just, for the rest of the way, I'm looking at him too, because I can't trust Reed to stay healthy. And tight end is just so darn thin. Yeah, all right. Let's go to you, Tags here. Who are your top five overall? And you can assume that Balaj is available if he, if he is. Oh, I mean, Balaj would def. I mean, he'd be the number one pickup for me. Uh, at least I know I get one week, one more, one more week out of him. Uh, yeah. Naheem Hines, two him, him himself, Savan Ahmed. I, I. I go back and forth on these two, um, but basically it's Naheem Hines, Savan Ahmed at, at two and three, uh, Jalen Rager at four, Alex Collins at five, and then Michael Pittman would probably be my number six. Yeah. All right. So we're all in the same range. Again, Balaj certainly number one if he's available. I'd go with Ahmed number two, Pittman three. Hines four and Rager five, but it is very close with a couple of those guys. And again, if you need a quarterback pickup, if you're desperate for a quarterback, just go ahead and push up Jameis Winston up to the top. All right, we talked about QB streamers, basically. I mean, I think, I mean, Jameis Winston is beyond just a streamer, but he certainly also could be a streamer this week. And Kirk Cousins versus Dallas. Are we missing anything else here at quarterback? Or I think we can probably just move to DST. You guys good with that? I think some people, uh, you know, consider Ben Roethlisberger a streamer as well. And, uh, you know, definitely against Jacksonville. I, you know, look, he doesn't have the deep arm that he used to have to, but he, he may have the best trio of wide receivers right now. And I, I think there are a lot of people just averse to using Roethlisberger. Just they have something in their, their mind where, you know, I don't know what it is. Some fantasy players have these little prejudices against players. And I, I, I've actually seen Ben Roethlisberger available on some free agent lists. Yeah, well, if he's available, certainly pick him up because the Steelers have absolutely no desire to run the ball at any <laughs> point this season. So certainly with those receivers, I mean, and again, I, I mentioned it last night, Tex, I can't, except for the fact that I roster James Conner in plenty of leagues, I can't criticize it because it is working for right. their offense. How about DST here? What widely available DST, Scott, are you looking at picking up for this week? Uh, I think a lot of people are going to be after this, but I said they were sleeper defense before the season. Miami has averaged over 10 fantasy points per game in the last five games. They have actually vaulted off to the number four defense. When people ask me on social media or in a chat on Rotoballer, what defense do you like for the rest of the season? I always say, unless you have the Steelers, there's, uh, you know, there's no defense that you can have for the rest of the season. But I think Miami, with how aggressive and turnover prone that they've been, they're getting kind of darn close. And then uh, you have the Chargers, of course, with the great matchups against the Jets. Minnesota, I want to see how they do tonight. Uh, you look uh, going against Dallas, though. 
Uh, Detroit possibly facing a backup quarterback, but not crazy about it. I actually do like Atlanta better with New Orleans because there is a potential for sacks and turnovers against Jameis Winston. That's what you look for. Not points allowed in this high-scoring new NFL. We saw Winston, you know, run around and get sacked a few times. Always capable of turnovers. And the Atlanta defense has been better since Dan Quinn was let go. How about you, Tags? Who's your favorite? I'm going to pull a page out of the Dan Harris uh, book and say the correct answer is the team playing the New York Jets. And <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, the, the Chargers were missing Joey Bosa last week. Uh, he should be back for this game, I would assume. Uh, the Jets, uh, they've allowed their quarterbacks to be sacked 26 times, pressured 41.5% of the time. Uh, that's not even including the lack of scoring and turnovers that you're going to get. So uh, the Chargers, if they're available, they'd be the ones. Yep. Yeah, I, I will echo, though, and I think that that's right as well. Of course, you always play against the Jets, but I will echo what Scott said is that Miami has just kind of been an undiscussed defense mm -hmm. that's been really very solid, especially lately. They get Denver, then they get the Jets next week. So even if you somehow didn't want to use them this week, go ahead and pick them up. I agree with that. All right, guys, let's close here with a little game of drop or keep. We'll list 10 guys who are fringe-worthy rosterable, but we're probably drafted, and we'll talk about whether or not we want to drop or keep them. We're going to start with a couple of situations where we can have multiple people. So if you would drop or keep any of these people, you can say keep. Let's start with drop or keep, Scott, any Bills running back. Uh, keep Zach Moss for touchdowns, drop Devin Singletary. How about you, Tags? I agree with that. So do I. All right, Tags, drop or keep any Ravens running back. <laughs> oh, man. Um, I... I uh... I feel like I want to keep J.K. Dobbins, but I don't think it's like a, out of necessity or anything like that. How, how about you, Scott? Yeah, I agree with, uh, agree with Mike. I want to keep J.K. Dobbins, but I need other roster spots. You know, to the waiver wire with all of you. Yeah, I'm probably keeping J.K. Dobbins just in the same <laughs> way I'm just keeping Jonathan Taylor because I can't bring myself to let it go, and I'm still always hoping that something's going to change. But, yeah, certainly Edwards, certainly Ingram. And if you absolutely had to, I'd be fine with Dobbins, but I would try to keep him. All right, uh, Scott, drop or keep any Broncos running back? I'll keep Melvin Gordon for potential touchdowns. Uh, and I'll keep Philip Lindsay because I think he's better than what he showed yesterday. How about you, Tags? <laughs> it's so sad. It's so sad. I, I mean, I would probably keep both of them and hope for an injury to one just because, I mean, but until that happens, I don't know if I could start either of them with confidence. I'd probably keep Melvin Gordon, but I would probably never start him, which, again, I will say at this point, you're in week 11, okay? The the idea of keeping guys here like, I can't start him right now, so we'll see. Maybe something will happen one day way in the future. There's an injury I'm not too keen on, but I you probably... You wouldn't start Melvin Gordon over Ryan Null? Okay, that is very fair. <laughs> I would definitely start, but, to, I mean, Scott, if you were available for a pickup, I would start you over Ryan Null, so <laughs> that's I'm, where we're I'm at with that I'm darn good one. men, I'll tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, let's get to the next one. Tags, drop or keep a 49ers running back not named Raheem Mostert? Uh, you could you could drop, I think, Jarek McKinnon. I think you could drop him. How about you, Scott? Not named Raheem Mostert, any San Francisco running back. I'm going to keep McKinnon because uh, I can't trust Mostert to stay healthy as much as I love to watch that guy. All right, Scott, drop or keep Marquise Brown? I'm going to drop him. You know, forget the name value. You know, it's been 10 weeks now, and I'd rather have Willie Sneed. Tags. <laughs> um <laughs> I, I, this is this is one of those this is one of those players that you drop and you kind of like you're just hoping somebody else puts him in their lineup because he's you you right. want to play him every week but it just makes you feel bad every time yeah i, I don't this it, is not a close call anymore for me tax this is there's no reason to hold Marquis i mean he Brown. has the third highest ta target share uh, among air yards in any player in the nfl like that's just that's ridiculous so he's not going to get any more volume that's not going to come it's just the efficiency has been yeah. so friggin' bad but their schedule in the playoffs is so friggin' good so you yeah, actually, let me let me ask you this mike though when you're looking at the air yards how many of those air yards are the balls that actually sail over his head? Oh, I agree. Well, that's yeah. the thing is like we can't expect any more. He's getting all the opportunity you could ask for in this offense, but it's just more about Lamar Jackson and not completing those passes like he did at times last year. And right. do we expect that to change? Probably not, but is it bad to have someone like that on your bench? The problem is it's too tempting to start him a lot of the times, uh, but to have him on your bench, I don't think that's the worst thing. Tags, you have said a lot of words, but I have still not heard either the words I'll keep, drop I'll, or I'll, keep. I'll, I'll, I'll keep, keep them, damn it. All right, that's fine, you'll keep. <laughs> I'm dropping all day long. Okay, go do tags on this one. Drop or keep Joe Burrow? 
Uh, keep. I have him actually as a top 12 quarterback rest season. How about you, Scott? Definitely keep him. I know exactly who you can stream him against, and you can't. When he faces bad defenses, he, 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 didn't throw, he didn't throw a touchdown pass against Indianapolis or Baltimore, played bad against the Steelers. But when he has a good matchup, there's volume. So I'm going to keep him. All right, Scott Dropper, keep Jared Cook. I have to drop. I, I mean, I have to keep him only because tight end is so terrible. And, you know, he's got a chance to score an occasional touchdown. He, you know, I, I'd, ra- I'd, I'd rather bank on him for a touchdown than Hunter Henry. How about you, Tex? I will keep him because the matchup this week is too juicy not to against the Falcons. I think it says everything that you need to know about the tight end position. That is, I never, ever, ever want to start Jared Cook, and he is a keep. Go to you, Tex. <laughs> uh, drop or keep Jarvis Landry. I'll keep, uh, yeah, the, the win games. I, I mean, he's played two games without Odell Beckham. Uh, he has seen 17 targets, if I'm not mistaken, uh, or 17 or 19. I can't remember what it is, uh, but he's by far and away the number one target on this team uh, when they do throw the ball. And the win games obviously affected the offense a lot. I'll keep him. He's not he's not an exciting option, but if you're looking for a floor guy, like a, a wide receiver four floor, uh, he's, he's fine. How about you, Scott? Yeah, uh, you know, Mike pretty much nailed it. You know, he's not exciting at all. Uh, but he can give you a decent floor. All right, Scott, drop or keep Emmanuel Sanders. This is this is a tough one. I feel like just when I could drop him, he's he's going to catch a touchdown pass. But I can't rely on him, so I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna cut him and Marquise Brown. How about you, Tex? Uh, so I. I, I'm probably going to keep him because, again, the matchup this week is so damn good against uh, the Falcons. And Traquan Smith, that was a nasty concussion that he yeah. suffered. So I don't know if he's going to even be available for this game, uh, which will lead to more snaps for Emmanuel Sanders because, believe it or not, Traquan was actually playing more snaps ahead of Emmanuel Sanders when all three of those guys were healthy and in the lineup. So um, I'll hang on to Emmanuel Sanders for this week. Yeah, I'm, I'll give the shoulder shrug, but I'm I'll probably hold him for at least one more week. Last one, tags, drop or keep Jonathan Taylor. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna say keep, and I'm gonna put this. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna say that if he does not get, if he does not score more than, I'm gonna put a line on it. If he doesn't score more than ten fantasy points in half PPR formats against the Packers this week, he is a drop. Okay, Scott. I'm keeping him right now. I mean, you look at the film; he's been terrible. He's been running to the backs of linemen. He's running into defenders. Mm-hmm. He's he's got no explosion, but. Uh, I think I'm going to keep him at the end of my bench because at some point, if he wakes up during the fantasy playoffs, I don't want to miss out. Yeah, I think this is the one guy who I'm like, I cannot imagine starting him anytime soon, but I refuse to drop him. So I I agree that I'm still keeping him, but not starting him, of course, unless something changes in Indianapolis. All right, that is it for today's show. Scott, thanks so much for coming on. Remind everybody where they can find all of you and your great work. Yeah, follow me at Scotty the King on Twitter, uh, rotoballer.com, uh, several articles every week. And, uh, of course, uh, Series XM Fantasy Sports Radio. I host the Rotoballer show Saturdays and Sunday mornings. You can always listen on demand. Sportsline.com with my waiver wire pickups today. And uh, Seahawks.com with my Seahawks Fantasy Insider every Tuesday and Wednesday. All right, awesome. Don't forget to check out our waiver wire assistant over at fantasypros.com slash my playbook for more help with your pickups. We'll be back tomorrow talking about rest of season rankings as well as trades. I'll talk to you then. Thanks for tuning into the Fantasy Pros YouTube channel. Make sure to check out our featured videos as well. Also, make sure to click that red subscribe button to get notified when we post videos in the future.